Now, briefly looking into what nutri, so nutri genetics is a gene diet interaction. Now, briefly looking into nutri genomics. So, nutri genomics is slightly different from nutri genetics. That is, nutri genomics is a study of the impact of nutrients of the diet on gene expression. So, let's assume that you're consuming some food, and the food that you consume has got nutrients. It's entering inside your body, and it has to be eventually absorbed by the cells. So you have a nutrient, the nutrient could be any kind of nutrient, macronutrient or a micronutrient, and that enters into the cell. And once it enters into the cell, it is being bound by certain factors which are called as transcription factors. So once the nutrient enters the cell, it's being bound by transcription factors. So these transcription factors, they bind to a specific region in the gene. That region is the promoter. You remember I mentioned about the promoter, the promoter at the 5 yeah, prime end. So this transcription factor goes and binds to the promoter and regulate the transcription. So this transcription factor is specific for a specific nutrient. For example, if your nutrient is a lipid molecule and the transcription factor that is specific for the lipid or the fatty acid will be PPAR. PPAR stands for proliferated, peroxisome proliferated activated receptor, which has got a region which is specific for the fatty acid. Then you have the CHREBP, which is specific for carbohydrate. So that is carbohydrate response element binding protein. For example, if your nutrient is a micronutrient such as vitamin D, then the transcription factor will be vitamin D receptor. So likewise, you have different transcription factors for different nutrients. So these transcription, the function of the transcription factor is to bind to the nutrient and take the nutrient to the cytoplasm where the DNA is. And the DNA, again, it is called the promoter region. They both go and bind to the promoter of the DNA and regulate the gene expression. The gene expression is nothing but where the DNA is converted to RNA. So what is the name of the step? Where the DNA, double stranded DNA is converted to transcription. transcription. So the mRNA is then released into the cytoplasm and the mRNA undergoes translation to produce the proteins and proteins are eventually converted to metabolites which are finally exported outside of the cell where they go and do different multiple functions. So in response to a particular nutrient, the mRNA and the proteins are being synthesized. This is what you call as nutri genomics. That is impact of the nutrient on the mRNA expression is called as transcriptomics. Transcript is nothing but mRNA transcript. That's how we call it. So it's called as transcriptomics. That is transcript is the mRNA and omics is expression. So mRNA expression. And the impact of the diet on protein expression is proteomics. Protein omics. Protein expression. And likewise, impact of the diet on what metabolites are synthesized, that would be metabolomics, metabolite expression. So you have transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. So they all come under the systems biology, which is kind of a holistic approach. If I want to study the impact of the diet on the entire gene regulatory mechanisms, then I want to look at how the nutrient, a particular nutrient, for example, high carbohydrate diet, how is that affecting my mRNA levels, protein levels, and metabolite levels. So all of this comes under nutri genomics. But the question is, why do, I, why do I have to study transcriptomics or proteomics or metabolomics? What is the purpose of studying all these omics technologies? How is that going to be relevant for personalized nutrition? How a body is responding, like how it is being metabolized and what is the response of that to our body? Yeah, so with that information, how will you do a personalized approach? Like if a person quantify, is, quantify the nutrients uh -huh. because uh, if we can measure and we can judge that what would be our effect after mm -hmm. taking the nutrients, uh, that maybe it would help us to quantify the nutrients which actually match our uh, genomic studies to give. So, for example, I'm consuming a high fat diet, and what would be what would you be yeah, looking at over here? If in that case, if it is a high fat diet, yeah. and it it just if just suppose we are having this kind of as we have discussed this uh, variations, mm -hmm. so we you know, we are not looking at genetic variations at all. You are just looking at the impact of the diet on the expression. So nutrigenetics is completely different. Mm -hmm. So don't mix that with that area. This one 
you are looking at the impact of the nutrient on mRNA expression, protein expression, metabolite expression. So in that case maybe that the two, two, two people are different. In one case the same kind of nutrients what we have uh, high fat nutrition, high lipid nutrition we are giving to a person but the but the uh, outcome is, is, is the normal but maybe in another case it is uh, the expression may be completely different. Yeah. So the metabolism. So I want to know like what is the outcome of that? Yeah. So you would be what are you trying to find out from that? You're saying there's a difference in the mRNA level, right? Yeah. How much of it has gone metabolized and other So that difference, what do you call that? You would be Okay, let me give you an example. How do you diagnose whether a person is type 2 diabetic or not? Excessive sugar in the blood. So yeah. what so a person who has got high amounts of fasting, fasting blood, sugar, blood sugar, you categorize them as type 2 diabetic, diabetic patient. And those who have normal blood sugar level, they are normal people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Apply the same phenomenon over them. For example, if they are consuming a high fat diet, and if the mRNA level is going up, protein level is going up, or whether the mRNA levels are suppressed, or protein levels are suppressed, that becomes a biomarker molecular marker for identifying whether that individual is at risk of developing obesity. Once you know that, okay, there is a difference in the levels of mRNA and proteins, then you can use that as a biomarker to develop therapeutic strategies. So the main purpose of doing nutrigenomic study is to identify novel biomarkers, molecular biomarkers. So these are all the molecular biomarkers. For example, the for example, you have 300 genes, for example, just for example. You're consuming a high-fat diet. People who consume high-fat diet, there are 100 genes which are suppressed and 200 genes which are overexpressed. But in normal person, you need to have 50 genes which are expressed and 150 genes which are expressed only when required. But instead of that, you see that out of the 300 genes, when you consume high-fat diet, you have 100 genes which are suppressed and 200 genes which are overexpressed. Whereas when you consume a high carbohydrate diet, the pattern will be different. So depending upon different diets, you see that there is a variation in the expression level. And this variation can be used as a biomarker for developing therapeutic targets. The therapeutic targets are nothing but the personalized nutrition strategies. If there is more of expression, like as you said, high fat diet, yeah. uh, 100 genes are suppressed and 200 are expressed. So this expression, I, how is it related to, like if they are high, more of So you know, like, see there are several companies which offer different arrays. Okay. Gene arrays, there are certain gene arrays, which has got the expression levels of all the 300 genes. You know that these are the genes which should be expressed and these are the genes which should not be expressed under normal dietary conditions. So if that is going to be abnormal, then that becomes a marker for diagnosing whether that individual is at risk. He might not be obese at that point, but that over a period of time is going to develop obesity. <coughs> so how can you bring those levels to the normal level? By nutrition therapy. Is that clear? Any other questions? Do you understand the difference between nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics? I think we should go for a short break, I guess. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> development of obesity. Now we are going to see how we can make use of these findings to develop personalized nutrition. But before that, we need to understand it. Right? So what is the link between physical activity, obesity, and genes? A lot of studies have explored the relationship between physical activity levels and obesity. Well, where? Lack of physical activity can increase the risk of obesity. But we do talk about the genetics of obesity a lot, but there is also a genetics behind physical activity levels. Quite recently, two years ago, there was a group where they looked at all the genes that are contributing to physical activity levels. That is, they carried out a genome-wide association study. As I said, it's a hypothesis free study. They screen the entire genome and they identify certain genetic variations which are contributing to the decreased levels of physical activity. Why a person is not used to the waist circumference and decreased physical activity levels. And they came up with these four genes. These four genes were identified by genome-wide association scans and these four genetic variations 
were found to be associated with increased waist circumference and decreased physical activity, and the study was published last year, in 2017. This is a very interesting study which brought a connecting link between physical activity and obesity with the connecting link as the genetic factor. This is from the point of genome-wide association studies, but there are certain genes, candidate genes for sports performance. And to date, these are the four important genes for sports performance. ACE gene. ACE gene encodes an enzyme which is called as the angiotensin converting enzyme. This enzyme has already been implicated in blood pressure regulation and also in maintaining and regulating the cardiovascular system. But this gene has got certain genetic variations which have been shown to be associated with superior sprint and other anaerobic <coughs> sports performances. And they have also been associated with increased muscle volume and also increased percentage of fast twitch muscle fibers which are required for sprint activities. And likewise, actin-3. The reason why I'm talking about the functional aspect of all these genes is that what genes and what polymorphisms are basically involved in sports performance and you need to understand the mechanisms and pathways by which they impact on the disease outcome or any other outcome. So unless you know the mechanism and the pathways, you will not be able to develop a personalized nutrition. For example, if I want to know whether a person is physically active or not, if I know that that person carries two copies of the genetic variation for being physically inactive, then I know that he is genetically predisposed to become obese. So how can I improve his physical activity levels? He needs more of the motivation compared to the person who carries zero copy. So these are the decisions that you make based on the mechanism. For example, actin-3 is basically a skeletal muscle protein and which is widely expressed in the fast twitch muscle fibers which are required for the rapid and fast contractions, muscle contractions, so which are required for the, the sprint activities and the superior sprint <coughs> activities and other sports performances. And finally, ADR, which is the adrenergic receptors. They again have an implication in the blood pressure regulation, but they also mediate the physiological effects of the hormone adrenaline and the neurotransmitter noradrenaline, and they also mediate the adipose tissue lysis, which is an important step in meeting the energy demands during endurance sports training. So these four are the most important genes. For example, if somebody wants to develop a personalized sports nutrition therapy, then these are the four genes that they should start with. So these genetic variations, these are the genetic variations which have been implicated in relation to sports nutrition for people who are specialized in sports nutrition field. So as I said, there are various factors that are affecting physical activity levels starting with social, individual attitudes, cultural, ethnic, workplace, schools, parents, physical environment, media, which plays a very important role, age, gender. But besides all these factors, there's another important factor, which is the genetic factor. So the way we perform in sports activities, or even like in day-to-day -day activities, some people, they prefer to climb the stairs, and some people prefer to take a lift. Why? that is all being controlled in your genes. Even, they, they know, even, even though they know that they have to climb the stairs to reduce their weight, still they take the lift. Why? Even that little bit of thought is being controlled by your genes and genetic variation. So that's what we are going to see, the gene-physical activity interaction. So we know that people who carry two copies of the obesity gene, they have increased genetic risk of obesity. That is well established, we know that. Now the question is whether doing more levels of physical activity can that overcome the genetic risk of obesity? So this was a question that was raised when this obesity gene was discovered. So I carried out a study like about like 10 years ago in 20,000 individuals from the UK population. So we, we measured the genetic variation whether those 20,000 people are zero copy or one copy or two copy. I measured their BMI levels. And in this graph, you can see that these are the four levels of physical activity that I identified in these 20,000 individuals. Active, moderately active, moderately inactive, and physically inactive individuals. On the y-axis, you find the BMI. As a first step, I want you to know whether people who carry two copies, 
whether they have higher levels of BMI in each of these categories. So these three bars are basically two copy, one copy, and zero copy. Okay, and you can see that people who carry the two copies they have higher levels of BMI. And when I carried out the statistical analysis, I can see that the p-values are significantly different between the 0, 1, and 2 with respect to BMI, which means that people who carry two copies, they have higher risk of gaining more BMI. So that was confirmed in the first step. And the next interesting finding is, if you look at the inactive group, you can see that the effects are highly prominent compared to the other three levels of physical activity. So if you look at the inactive group, the effect is 0.44. This 0.44 is nothing but 0.44 kilogram per meter square increase in BMI for every risk copy that you have. So if you have one copy, then the risk is increased by 0.44 kilogram per meter square increase in BMI. So if you have two copies, what will be the risk? 0.88. So 0 for 0 copy, this is for 1 copy, and this is for 2 copies. So I found that if you are physically inactive, if you are leading a sedentary life, then your risk increases by 0.44 kilogram per meter square increase in BMI for every increase in the copy that you have. But whereas if you look at the active, moderately active, moderately inactive, you can see the effect is 0.2, which is half of 0.44. So if you do more levels of physical activity, you can reduce your genetic risk of obesity. So that's the take home message. So if you do more levels of physical activity, you can overcome the genetic risk of obesity. But if you lead a sedentary life, then you're increasing the genetic risk of obesity. Is that clear? So this is what the study conveyed, and then several other groups from UK, Europe, US, they all started to find, and they were like mixed reviews. So some people were able to find a very interesting gene physical activity interaction, but some people failed to confirm my finding. So what we did, like our group carried out another study in 200,000 individuals from the UK, US, and Europe. We collected all the information about the genetic variant, and also we collected the information about the obesity risk and we carried out something called as a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis where we pull the data from different populations and we carry out an analysis that results in something called as a forest plot. Don't worry about this plot. I'm not going to go into the technical details of the study, but if you look at the overall p-value for interaction, which is 0 0.0049. So this interaction p-value indicates that even if you carry two copies of the obesity gene, you can still overcome the genetic risk of obesity by doing more levels of physical activity. And that was proved in 200,000 individuals. So then everybody stopped working on this because that is the maximum number one could achieve in terms of doing a large scale analysis. And that basically confirmed that you can overcome the genetic risk of obesity by doing more levels of physical activity. Any questions on this? Yeah, yeah, go was, was the diet also seen? Like, uh, no, only physical. They were because getting activity. information from 200,000 individuals is not a joke. No, no. Yeah. In the earlier study, in the first study which you had, yeah. where they first uh, found that the genes were, were, was, they were actually... We, no, no, no. We didn't look at the dietary information at Nothing. all. Dietary intake was available, but we didn't look at it. Mm -hmm. We just looked at the gene physical activity interaction. We wanted to know what is the impact. Because if you start including too many factors into your analysis, you will not be able to make a proper conclusion. You just want to know whether physical activity is being reduced, is the, is the effect being affected by the genes. That is your question. If I include the dietary component, then if you get a mixed finding, you will not know whether is it the diet that is contributing to the finding, or is it the physical activity that is contributing to the finding. I think this is really the physical activity was the same for all three individuals. Like, Sorry, I didn't get you. And in this case... <coughs> yeah. Which, you mean the previous yeah. study? Yeah. The physical activity was same for like uh, the category, three categories, like zero, hetero, and oh, yeah. zero, one, and two. Hmm. Yeah. The yeah. Physical so activity was same. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for each group, if hmm. I say active, it's the same for all these three group of individuals. Means this is, they were same activity. Yeah, I mean, right. they were standardized. Like yeah. they were getting up at the same time. They were doing all. Same no, you can't say. 
getting up. But you have like a range of factors. For example, um, they are doing like three to four hours of physical activity per week. So those people will be moderately active. So you categorize them into a particular group. So which means three to four hours means like some people might be we three hours. We study their uh, like lifestyle and everything. We just study three or four you know, hours of their yeah. activity. Like so we go by lifestyle. the global physical activity questionnaire, which has been standardized for all the population. Mm -hmm. And we use that questionnaire to measure the physical activity levels. Yeah, yeah so I just wanted to know how you got the physical activity yeah. okay. through that questionnaire. Well. Any other questions? So the take home message is basically you can overcome. Oh, sorry. sorry. Can you go back? Oh, yeah, sure. Interesting to see that uh, with moderately inactive populations. Moderately inactive? Yeah, the least. Is lower P value than is least in moderately inactive. What could be the reason? Yeah, see, as an academic, I don't go by the p values. Sometimes right. p values might not be statistically significant. But still, it could be biologically significant. And sometimes, it might not be biologically significant, still you'll see that the p-values are significant. So this variation in the p-values could be because of the sample size. If you look at the sample size, 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, but this one is much small, smaller than these sample sizes. So which could be the reason why, for genetic studies, you definitely need large number of samples. Because after this study, as I said, there were a lot of studies which were conflicting my study. So that's the reason why we carried out this study in 200,000 individuals to put a full stop to this entire controversy. Right. Any other question? No, but, the, but the desire for physical activity you say is also dependent on the genetic variation. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly the whole point. Like maybe it's the two copy people, they don't have the motivation. motivation. So which is what is given by the therapist. <laughs> Now let's move on to the gene diet interaction. So we have seen the gene physical activity interaction. Now let's see the gene diet interaction. I'm not going to say anything different over here. I'm just going to say how healthy diet can overcome the genetic risk of obesity. So I'm going to give you some examples of my own studies. One study is something that we did in 11,000 individuals from five different European countries where we looked at the impact of the genes and glycemic index on weight gain, where we followed up those individuals for three and a half years. And in this graph, you find that on the x-axis, you find the glycemic index. On the y-axis, you find the weight change per year. And these three lines are basically two copies, one copy, and zero copy. OK? So as glycemic index increases, you can see that the annual weight change also significantly increases for people who carry two copies of the genetic variant. Whereas people who carry one copy or zero copy, the annual weight change did not change significantly. So what is the conclusion of this? How do you conclude this finding? Zero copy had more tolerant to carbohydrates? Whenever you make a conclusion, think about the people who are at a higher risk. So make your conclusion with respect to two copies. Uh, because zero you know, copy, we know that they are protected already. Yeah, so, so, so if you want to give a public health message okay. to the population, it has to be from the people who are at higher risk. Yes. So what will be the conclusion? Are you a nutritionist? Yes. Okay, so you have this finding <coughs> right in front of you, and you are providing a personalized diet. So what would be the personalized diet? Probably we will give them Probably low glycemic index diets. Diet? For whom? For uh, two copies. Exactly. Yeah. So lowering the dietary glycemic index will be the effective way to reduce weight gain yes. for people who carry two copies two of the obesity gene variation. So if you <coughs> took glycemic index of some, like how do you took this glycemic index? You gave them something? What, what no, no, it's not an intervention study at all. The way you calculate the glycemic index based on whatever dietary intake information you collect from the population. It's just a, a FFQ that was oh. done, foot frequency questionnaire. Okay. So this is how we translate the nutrigenetics findings to personalized nutrition. But again, I'm stressing upon the point that we are talking only about one genetic variant. So when you're prescribing a personalized diet, it's very important that you need to take into consideration of a panel of genetic variation. You have to check whether, for example, if you have 10 genetic variations, you have to see whether for all those 10 genetic variations, whether a person is zero copy or two copy or one copy or zero copy, one, whatever. So you have to take into account of all these information and then 
implement the personalized nutrition. So this is just for an example how you translate the nutrigenetics findings to personalized nutrition. I'm going to give you another example which was done in the US population in 37,000 individuals. This is looking at the impact of the fried foods on obesity and also looking at the genetic risk. So first we stratify the population into three groups based on the amount of fried foods that they consume. That is consuming fried foods one time, less than one time per week, one to three times per week and more than four times per week. In the first study which was done in 9,000 individuals, we found that people who consume fried foods more than four times per week, they had increased genetic risk of gaining higher BMR. Likewise, the other two studies also showed the same impact and when we combined all the three studies and we carried out a meta-analysis that again showed that people who consume the unhealthy diet or the fast food or the fried foods, they had increased genetic risk of obesity. And last example, so I'm sure you all know about the Mediterranean diet. So Mediterranean diet is healthy or unhealthy? It's a healthy diet, so which is rich in omega-3 fatty acids, fruits and vegetables. So we wanted to know whether this healthy diet has got any impact on whether a person develops obesity or not. So it's going back to the same study which was done in 11,000 people from five different European countries. So we found that people who carry two copies of the obesity gene variation, they had increased risk of gaining weight over a period of time. Next, we wanted to know is it all the individuals who are developing or gaining more weight or is it one group of individuals who are not gaining weight? So we identified that people who consume high amounts of Mediterranean foods, which is a healthy food, they alone were able to overcome the genetic risk of gaining weight. Whereas people who consume lower <laughs> amounts of Mediterranean foods, they had increased genetic risk of obesity. So this is another interesting finding which goes back to the point that healthy diet can overcome the genetic risk of obesity. How this genetic risk was assessed? This genetic risk, how was it assessed? Yeah, based on whether the individual carry zero copy or one copy or two copies. No, but they were having, they, you made them have a healthy diet. Like what? No, no, it was not an intervention study at all. We just assessed their Medi uh, Mediterranean dietary intake using a food frequency questionnaire, mm -hmm. which is specific for the Mediterranean diets. Mm -hmm. Then we saw that some people were consuming more amounts of Mediterranean foods and some people were consuming low amounts of Mediterranean foods and people who consumed higher amounts, they were able to overcome the genetic risk. They had lesser BMI compared to people. Yeah. Any other questions? So the take home message is that the genetic factor and the lifestyle factors, they do not work independent of each other. Rather, they work together, they interact together, contributing to the development of obesity. So even if you carry two copies of the obesity gene, you can still overcome the genetic risk by doing more levels of physical activity and consuming a healthy diet. So all the examples so far that I've given, they have all been done in the UK population or US population or in the European population, all in Western countries. So when I started to think about this, there were no studies in South Asian population. So that was the time I started to think about implementing this nutrigenetics concept in developing countries. So I started a large scale collaborative effort, which is called as a genuine collaboration, but this should be changed now, it's four years, which is called as the gene nutrient interactions. Genuine stands for gene nutrient interaction. And uh, the main objective is to perform a large scale analysis of gene diet interactions in Asian countries and developing <coughs> countries. So these are the uh, countries in which I've implemented the nutrigenetic analysis and uh, these are the uh, publications from this and what you see in the brackets are basically the funding organization that are funded to do this uh, nutrigenetic studies in these population. So I'm going to focus on one of these populations but the question is why do we have to look at the developing country for nutrigenetic analysis? So let's have a look at the nutritional challenge in developed and developing countries. So if you take the UK population, they consume a high fat diet. If you, consume, if you take the Indian population or Pakistani population, high carbohydrate diet. If you take the Moroccan Turkish population, it's a mixture of high protein, high carbohydrate diet. If you take the South American population, again high carbohydrate and high fat diet. So you can see that the dietary patterns are all 
different. And we all know from this that the genetic makeup is also different. 99% of the genome is the same, but 1% is different in all the individuals. So our genetic makeup is different, the dietary factors are different, and geographically all these individuals are separated from each other. But there is one common thing across all these countries that unites all these countries together. What is that? No, I'm not talking about the diet. The diet is different. What we are eating in India is different from what people are eating in Brazil. Even the rice that we consume is different from the rice they consume. So everything is different. The diet is different. Genes are different. Geographically, they are different. Even the physical activity levels are quite different. We are less physically active compared to all other countries. So everything is different. But there's one common thing. What is that? 99% genome. Well, that I've already said. <laughs> Something that I've been said. Very clever. <laughs> What is that one common thing that unites all these countries? Obesity. Exactly. Increased prevalence of type 2 diabetes and obesity. The prevalence is increasing even though the diet is different, genes are different, geographical location is different, environmental exposure is different, physical activity levels are different, but still there is an increased prevalence of type 2 diabetes and obesity in all the countries. And also, the general dietary recommendation which have been uh, being carried out like in different population, it's not working at all. Why is the prevalence increasing if the general dietary recommendations are supposed to be working, right? So that's why we are moving into the field of personalized nutrition, whether that could be supportive of reducing the burden of obesity and diabetes. And that's the reason why we are doing this nutrigenetic analysis, gene diet interactions, in both developed and also in developing countries. So I'm going to give you an example of uh, a study which is relevant for the Indian population. So because I am doing a collaboration with Dr. Mohan's Diabetes Speciality Center in uh, South India. So we carried out a study on 2,000 individuals, which is a case control study, 1,000 people with normal glucose tolerance and 1,000 people who have type 2 diabetes. So I'm going to present some interesting findings from that study. So why nutrigenetic study is so important for the Indian population? First of all, they have a different genetic makeup and they have unique but varying dietary patterns. For example, if you compare the North Indian population, South Indian population, diets are so different. And increasing prevalence of type 2 diabetes and obesity, both North India and South India. And no nutrigenetic studies to date. So without nutrigenetics, there's no future for personalized nutrition. So these are the reasons why we wanted to initiate a nutrigenetic study in Indian population. The first finding is basically an interaction between the obesity gene variant and carbohydrate energy percentage on obesity. Because this is the first finding of an interaction of the FTO gene with carbohydrate. Because in Western population, most of the interactions was mainly with fat intake. Because fat represents the majority, so, uh, the, the main source of energy. Whereas here in the Indian population, the main source of energy comes from Carbohydrate. carbohydrate. So we found a very interesting interaction. So in this graph, you see the turtles of carbohydrate intake. And Y axis, you find the odds ratio, that is what is the risk of developing obesity. And these red bars are people who carry two copies. And we found that the overall interaction was significant. And we found that people who consume high amounts of carbohydrate and those who carry two copies of the obesity gene, they had 2.46 times increased risk of obesity compared to people who carry zero copy and one copy. So which clearly shows that if you carry two copies of the obesity gene and if you consume a high carbohydrate diet, then your risk of obesity is increased by 2.46 times. What percentage was for this high carbohydrate? What, what, what is the percentage which you took? Well, it's all again based on the, the, the turtles. We just took the turtles. We no, made like sure that we had the equal number of individuals. No, no, no. I'm yeah. saying like 50 to 60 is the ideal percentage which should be a carbohydrate. Yeah. Oh, you population. mean the percentage, yeah, percentage of the intake. Of the so that was like more than 60% or something. And then the moderate and the low. Moderate was? Moderate was somewhere in between, I think, 40 to 50, something like that. But then ideally we say, uh, for a normal healthy lifestyle, we say yeah. 50 to 60 is the normal. Yeah. So no, but like this is medium. As I said, we didn't categorize them based on the health status. We categorized based on, we wanted to make sure that all the groups have equal number of individuals. Because if you ca classify them based on the health status, you might find that there might be 10 people here, 20 people here, and 50 people or 60 people. No, I'm not here. talking about the health status. Yeah. I'm talking about the carbohydrate energy percentage. Yeah, no, we didn't go by the dietary recommendation. We just went by the turtles. How 
that I just wanted to know what are the like what were the carbohydrate energy percentage Percent. for low, medium, and high? high. Yeah. yeah. So this was like about sixty percent, okay. and this was somewhere like between forty to fifty or something, and okay. this was below thirty or something. Okay. So these were the three groups of whatever like we found as the normal distribution. So we stratified them based on their types. So we found that like people who consume high amounts of carbohydrate and those who carry two copies, they had increased risk of obesity. And next, we also found a very interesting interaction with the high fiber diet. So this is on waist circumference. So in this graph, on the x-axis, you find the types of dietary fiber. On the y-axis, you find the waist circumference. The blue, the, 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 the blue striped and the red bars are basically zero copy, one copy, and two copies. Is that clear? So the overall interaction was strongly significant and we wanted to know what is the interaction. And if you look at the people who consume high amounts of fiber rich foods, we found that people who consume high amounts of fiber rich foods and those who carry two copies, they were able to reduce their waist circumference by 1.62 centimeters. That is, even if you carry two copies, because high fiber diet is considered to be a healthy diet. So even if you carry two copies of the genetic variation, if you consume a high fiber diet, which is a healthy diet, you can overcome the genetic risk of central obesity. In this case, it responded more rather than the zero copy and one copy. Yeah, exactly. So people who carry two copies, they are at a higher risk, mm. and they were able to reduce the waist circumference by 1.62 centimeter, mm because of the fact that they were consuming a healthy diet, that is a high fiber diet. So this is an impact that we found on waist circumference and also on BMI. And how can we justify that by zero and one copy there was an increase with high? See, as I said, we are talking about one genetic variant over here. As I said, there are 2.8 million genetic variations. So maybe zero and one copy people, they might be carrying two copies for other genetic variations. We just focused on one genetic variation. So we cannot make a firm conclusion that this is the finding. But this is one of the findings contributing to the complexity of obesity. But then this can happen to two copies also. Like with, we're talking about two copies, there may be any, there may be other variants yeah. which would be affecting in two copies. And yeah, that's true. But so we today we know for sure that FTO is the gene, which is, which is the gene for obesity. We know that for sure because that explains 2% of the variation in obesity. Whereas other genetic variations together, they contribute to only about 0.8% genetic variations for obesity. So with this respect, you can see this is not like a very small effect. It's a very big effect with respect to two copies. So when you're able to reduce the genetic risk of obesity by 1.62 centimeter, that's a very big impact for a sample size of 2,000 individuals. Any other question? So this is actually another outcome. So I, I don't have the slide for the BMI. We found the same effect that we found for waist circumference and also for BMI. So we thought like this could be a finding only for central obesity, but we also found a finding which is relevant for common obesity where the measure was BMI. And we also found like very interesting interaction between the gene variant and physical activity for the Indian population. So in this graph, you have three levels of physical activity, physically inactive, moderately active, and physically active, and we found that among people who are physically inactive and those who carry two copies of the obesity gene, they had significantly higher BMI. The BMI effect was 0.95 kilogram per meter square, whereas in the Western population it was only 0.44. The impact was much more higher for the Indian population compared to the Western population. So this is on BMI, and we also found a similar effect on waist circumference where people who carry two copies of the genetic variant and also who are physically inactive, they had higher levels of waist circumference compared to people who have zero copy or one copy. But this finding was similar to what we have identified for the Western population, but then the effect was much more higher for the Indian population compared to the Western population. Any questions on this? So this is the first nutrigenetic study in this um, Asian Indian population. Again, like looking at obesity, physically active, moderately active, physically inactive. So people who are physically inactive, they had higher risk of obesity. So in summary, you can see that the obesity gene variant, it interacts with the carbohydrate intake, dietary fiber, and physical activity levels on obesity. 
So in terms of translating this finding, nutrigenetics finding, to personalized nutrition, what would be the appropriate new personalized nutrition strategy? Yeah. Low glycemic, high fiber diet. Yeah. Low glycemic, high fiber diet. Or low carbohydrate intake. Exactly. So for and more level of physical activity. Yeah, for whom? For the two copies. For the two, two copies. copies. Yeah. So by taking into account of looking at the two copy people, so the, the personalized strategy would be providing them a diet that is low in carbohydrates, high in dietary fiber, and suggesting them to exhibit high levels of physical activity. So that will be an effective strategy to overcome obesity in future. They might not be obese at this stage, but then they can prevent the development of obesity. So prevention is better than cure. So that is the key concept behind personalized nutrition. So because people think that, okay, personalized nutrition is only for people who have an health issue, but actually even healthy people can go and make sure that like they can overcome the genetic risk of obesity or diabetes or any disease. So this is actually uh, more finding from other populations as well. So this is a published paper from the Gentleman Collaboration. So I'm not going into other populations due to lack of time. So briefly touching upon personalized nutrition, as I said, it's the development of an optimum diet for an individual according to that individual's genetic makeup. So the main question is a lot of people, like when this came into picture, people started to ask, why do we need personalized nutrition? Well, several years ago, we had this head and shoulders shampoo, which is applicable for any kind of hair type. But today, we have one kind of shampoo for silky hair, smooth hair, long hair, dry hair, short hair. So when you could personalize your commodities just for the sake of your hair, why, cannot, why you cannot personalize your diet for the sake of your health? So no more arguments. So a study was done in the US population in 2010. They wanted to know what is the awareness on nutri genomics and nutrigenetics. So they wanted to know whether they do understand the concept behind nutrigenetics. So they identified that only 6% of the population in the US, they had some knowledge about nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics, where like half of the population did not have any idea about nutrigenetics. So that was a situation in 2010 in the US population. So you could imagine what would be the situation in the Indian population, or any developed country for that sake. So the first aspect is to bring the awareness about nutrigenetics by conducting these kind of workshops. And uh, so this is one personalized nutrition program that we initiated, which is called as the foodformeat.org, which is a European Union funded program where we have like seven different European countries, including UK. And uh, that is basically finished now, but still we are publishing a lot of papers. So if you're interested, go into this website. You can look into the research publications. And the main idea is basically developing an online personalized nutrition software and where you can give the customers the opportunity to complete the questionnaire online. And we send the buckle swap samples to us and we do the genetic analysis and we try to link whether the genes that they carry are the zero copy or one copy and two copy. And we also try to look at the consumer attitudes <coughs> towards personalized nutrition. So how do they feel by giving the blood samples? Because some people said that we don't want to give it to a private company. I'm happy to give my blood sample if that's being funded by a government organization. If it's coming from a government hospital or government funded project, then I'm happy to provide my biological samples. But if it's being coming, if it's coming from a private organization, then they are not happy about it. So these are different attitudes. That's for the Western population. It could be entirely different for the Indian population. So or any developing country for that sake. So that would be an interesting aspect to look at. So again, the take home message from this whole workshop is that healthy diet and high levels of physical activity can overcome the genetic risk of obesity. So even if you carry two copies of this obesity gene or two copies of all the genes for obesity, you can still overcome the genetic risk. So just to acknowledge and thank all my collaborators who have supported me and it's time for nutrigenetics workshop activity. But before that, I want to answer all the questions if you have any. So you have time to ask all the questions.